Um, my name is Ben. I've been working in the housing and homeless sector for the last decade, almost, either by experience or by paid employment. Uh, so the panel is Professor John Barry from Queen's University and Miran Lynch, who's a researcher at the Economic and Social Research Institute. I thought it could be good for them both to just introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the research for a moment. So if John, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, that's great, Ben, and good morning, uh, everybody. So uh, as Ben mentioned, I'm um, Professor of Green Political Economy at Queen's University, Belfast, and I also co-chair the Belfast Climate Commission, and I've had a long-term interest in the intersections of socioeconomic uh, inequality within societies, but also between societies and the climate crisis. So I don't know what, Ben, do you want me to give my opening re remarks now, or do you want Muran to introduce herself and then we'll do the opening remarks? Go for Muran first, and then we'll do the remarks. Sure, yeah. So uh, Muran Lynch, I'm a senior research Hi. officer in ESRI. Um, I've been there ever since I finished my PhD, um, and uh, I'm currently the um, the research area coordinator for energy, which means that the um, I essentially coordinate energy economics research um, across the ESRI. And I've had um, uh, I kind of started off my research in renewable energy integration and uh, market design for renewables and how to increase renewable penetration in electricity markets. And since then it's kind of branched out a lot. Um, so we've done some work on um, carbon taxation and um, electrification of heat and transport, particularly heating, starting to look at green hydrogen and the green economy. And then since the energy crisis obviously taken on an awful lot more of a role in looking at how increased energy prices are impacting households and businesses and policy responses to mitigate that. Great. Should we just say a few remarks about what is happening at the moment? Yeah, sure, Ben, I'm, I'm happy to uh, kick off. Um, my main message, in a way, is that it's not a cost of living crisis, it's a cost of, uh, cost of profiteering crisis. And there's an inextricable link between this cost of profiteering crisis and the climate and planetary crisis we're now experiencing. So I've written a few um, comments here. I'll, I'll read them out. I'm happy to share them with people afterwards. So a quote, uh, this grotesque greed is punishing the poorest and most vulnerable people while destroying our only common home. I urge all governments to tax these excessive profits of fossil fuel companies and use the funds to support the most vulnerable people through these difficult times. Not the words of a radical eco-socialist politician or a trade unionist like Mick Lynch, but those of UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres calling out the obscene profits made by oil and gas corporations this year. They've soared. And while some of this has to do with the war in Ukraine, this is not the full explanation for the inflation in the price of energy. BP, for example, revealed its profits had nearly tripled in the past three months to 7 billion compared to 3 billion a year earlier. And in total, the world's largest five largest fossil fuel corporations had a combined profit of 150 billion this year at a time of misery for millions where people are facing the awful choice between heating or eating in their homes. And that's quite rightly a focus, obviously, and the, the, the issue of today's discussion of the cost of living crisis. But I hope even from those opening remarks, we should really reframe this both politically and analytically as a cost of profiteering crisis. And I think we have this spectre now extending across many countries, certainly in Europe and indeed beyond of fuel poverty. And indeed, it's not possible to talk about the issue of fuel poverty that is very acute for many of our citizens without connecting it to the climate crisis. And more importantly, we've both you know, often neglected in, in issues of fuel poverty or energy poverty uh, and the climate crisis is that both of them are in, intersected in terms of injustice, particularly within Ireland and Britain, and certainly where myself and Lauren live in Northern Ireland, a recent report has estimated that the impacts 
of the increase in the price of, of oil in particular, because Northern Ireland is unique in probably Europe in having so much of our space heating based upon oil, coupled with really badly insulated housing. The estimate is that 75% of households in Northern Ireland will be in fuel poverty. What that means is they're spending more than 10% of their income. That's a social emergency, if ever there was at three quarters of a population being in fuel poverty. But the reality is half of global carbon dioxide emissions, and many of you may know this, are caused by just 10% of the richest and most affluent across society. And only 10% of emissions globally are emitted by 50% of the world's population. So we must always remember this you know, connection between affluence and uh, carbon emissions. But yet this issue is never rarely or very rarely discussed in the public media discussion around the climate crisis. And essentially what we're looking at is how can we curb the excess carbon related emission lifestyles of about 800 million people? And indeed, some of us listening to this discussion, we're part of this 10%. Uh, we may not feel ourselves to be particularly rich and affluent, but actually we live many of us lives that are immeasurably more affluent and effluent in terms of production of emissions than many other uh, members of the human family and picking the global south. And the quickest way in some respect of addressing both the climate and indeed the cost of profiteering crisis is through redistribution. And that's why I, I certainly think I'd, I'd speak for some of us certainly on this call and, and it's been in the ethos of the Just Transition Greens to adopt an explicitly eco-socialist position that rather than growth as the way of bringing people out of poverty, we need, we need to see that poverty is caused by inequality. So therefore we wanna address the root causes of whether it's poverty or fuel or other forms of inequality, we need to make our societies less unequal. And this is why we literally cannot afford the rich. Uh, in terms of uh, the substantive ecocidal nature of our current global societies, never mind the other you know, major social problems caused by inequality, we have to make our societies less unequal. And I think the energy crisis that we're now experiencing has you know, hastened, I think, the debate about the transition beyond fossil fuels to be as quick and as equitable as possible. And the reason for this is simple, is that I think the energy crisis has brought into sharp uh, purview the fact that once energy increases in price, almost everything else increases. Energy is literally the foundation of our economies, civilizations, and societies. And, and to understand this, and some of you maybe heard me talk about this before, and it's a great kind of dinner party or pub discussion before you have a too, too, uh, too many, is to ask yourself, in the room you're sitting in now, can you name anything in that room that hasn't been made in whole or part or transported there in whole or part without the use of fossil fuels, uh, oil, coal, or gas? It's really, really difficult. And that in part is the, the major challenge that we face in terms of how do we move away from a suboptimal and dangerous fuel, but at the same time, our societies, economies, aspirations, ways of life, uh, and so on, are inextricably bound up with this suboptimal and now dangerous form of energy. And the reality is that we need to see that with the inflation that we're experiencing in many parts of the world, it is absolute bullshit to hear in the right wing and even mainstream media that somehow the demands by workers for wage increases are somehow causing inflation. And it's the opposite. Wages are chasing inflation, inflation being driven by the increase in energy and other basic goods. But of course, as I said, once energy increases, almost everything else um, increases. And I do think there are substantial um, areas of price gouging and profiteering that is going on in the food sector, that's going on particularly in, in energy. And we can't blame everything as the mainstream media often puts it, and indeed most conventional politicians, and some heavy blame everything on the war in Ukraine. It's almost like my bad teeth and so on. And other parts of our lives were dissatisfied we can blame on the war in Ukraine. And the reality is that the first job of any government is to protect the most vulnerable. And I, I don't think our governments, whether it's the UK or the Republic of Ireland, are doing a very good job. And you know, certainly in the UK, where myself and, and Lauren both currently live, the, the drumbeats of austerity are already beginning in, under the new Prime Minister, Richie Sunak. And I do fear that this is how uh, things will play out, particularly under the Conservatives, although uh, it still remains to be seen whether or not Keir Starmer and Labour would make things any differently, that austerity is going to be the price that we'll pay for dealing with some of the issues of how governments have 
in a milk and water fashion intervened to help people out. Much more robust interventions that we've seen during the pandemic is more of the order of what I think governments need to be doing. You know, think about it. Homelessness was almost eradicated during the pandemic. And yet now, particularly the cold winter that many of us are facing, and particularly if you go down in the streets of Dublin, many of us can see with our own eyes now that now homelessness is back with a vengeance. We should always remember that the issue is never the lack of money. A sovereign state with the ability and to have some control over its own currency, and of course it's different between the UK and Ireland, given that the UK was never part of the Eurozone and is now out of the EU. But the real issues for all our economies is the actual assets, resources of our societies, uh, and not necessarily uh, the money that's available. But that is the narrative that many of us have been increasingly uh, subject to over the years. So the, the four points I want to end with in terms of the lessons that we can see from the current uh, cost of profiteering crisis is that we need state intervention in the provision of energy and food and the basic necessities of citizens. And I think that is where issues around universal basic services should certainly be part of our discussions. I certainly think universal basic income, while modestly progressive, is way inferior to universal basic services. And that's a discussion that we need to have, I think, within the Green Party and just transition Greens more generally. And I, to go back to a point I made earlier, redistribution as opposed to economic growth should be the policy to deal with both the cost of profiteering and the climate crisis. And indeed, we need to see that both the climate science, the latest IPCC reports, is indicating a post-growth trajectory for those of us in the global north, the overdeveloped world, and that where growth should be should be in the global south to lift people out of poverty. But also we have evidence from wonderful research and it's a book I'd encourage you all to read by Wilkinson and Pickett from 2008 called The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better, in that we have not just climate reasons for redistribution and moving away beyond growth, but also we have social and health benefits of moving beyond a growth orientated economy. And finally, there is no status quo solution to the profiteering and the climate crisis. And I think this is now in keeping with the best available climate and social scientific analysis is that we need to reform and transform our societies beyond growth, beyond carbon and beyond capitalism. And just my reasons for that is the recent letter that I was a signatory to of the world's scientists warning on the climate crisis. And what it said is quite starkly, humanity cannot sustain unlimited growth in a finite world. We need to address ecological overshoot while at the same time ramping up climate action. Keys to curbing the ecological overshoot involve greatly reducing overconsumption in the global north and the waste by the global middle classes and especially the wealthy and the super affluent, stabilizing and gradually reducing the human population by providing education and the rights for women and girls. I suppose you've partially answered my one of the questions I have here, John. Um, but was the current cost of living crisis always inevitable? And would Moran like to uh, come in on that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I've got about five minutes <laughs> of remarks ready, and we'll try to stick to that. So first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I like, honestly delighted. Um, to get the invitation and uh, was really interested in John's remarks and um, great take on so many things, so many areas of overlap. So I might slightly adjust what I was going to say because you've actually said some of what I was going to say. Um, so I guess um, the first thing that kind of springs to mind when we talk about this cost of living crisis and inflation is that um, it's, it's actually quite recent in I suppose economic memory when when kind of prices started to climb um, as a result initially of the pandemic so even before Ukraine when prices started to go up we were kind of scratching our heads and um, you know kind of macroeconomists I'm not a macroeconomist macroeconomists were kind of thinking back to stuff that they learned in textbooks in undergraduate because it had actually been a few decades since we had to deal with inflation as practitioners um, and one of the things that kind of jumped out for me immediately is that we do need to learn from the past. So there were an awful lot of lessons learned from the Great Depression in the 1930s that were applied under the Great Recession in the last decade. Now, that didn't necessarily apply to Ireland because we were incredibly constrained in what we could do due to international factors. But if you look at, for example, the United States in, in the 1930s, 
the response to the depression was to raise interest rates and cut back on spending. The United States did the opposite under the Great Recession and particularly under the Obama administration. And um, because we learned from the past, we learned what works and what doesn't work in these Great Recessions. We need to do the same now. We need to think back to the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the oil crises, the inflation that we experienced then and learn what works and what doesn't work. And we also need to learn from more recent experiences in the likes of Japan, where they had what we call stagflation for a very long time. So stagflation is where you have increasing prices, um, but no real growth in the economy. And that just means that the whole thing stagnates and living standards simply cannot improve under that circumstance. Um, another thing that we have learned and that I think that Irish policymakers have very much tuned into is the fact that inflation impacts on lower households, uh, lower income households far more than um, higher income households. And that's because lower income households tend to spend more of their income on consumables. So things like food, energy, um, clothing, day-to-day -day necessities, whereas higher income households spend more of their income on durables. So things like new cars, new fridges, washing machines, maybe get an extension, that kind of thing. Um, and so what that means is that this is absolutely um, a justice issue. It is an equality issue and it is a redistribution issue. Um, and one thing that we do have in common at the moment with the previous um, crises in cost of living is that they were both energy driven. Now, er, the initial uptick in prices, like I said, was issues to do with pandemic. But now it's all about the energy prices. And as we know, energy prices as a crucial input good feed into absolutely everything. I thought that thought experiment that John gave was fantastic. Like every single thing that you buy, use, eat, drink, wear, fossil fuels went into the production of it at some point. So that means that if the price of energy goes up, the price of everything else goes up eventually. And that means that energy policy has to be to the heart of addressing this cost of living crisis. Um, and there are trade-offs in energy policy. Sometimes in order to decarbonize, we make energy more expensive. Sometimes in order to conserve energy, we impact on higher income households more than lower or vice versa. And those are the trade-offs that we have to keep in mind when we're designing our energy po policies. So in relation to the profiteering, it certainly is true that because the spot price of energy has gone so high, any company that has not seen an increase in their costs of energy, I don't want to say energy production, we don't produce energy. So that means that any increase in uh, the price, but not in the cost that these companies are facing then by definition results in more profits. Now, when we, the way we design energy markets and electricity markets in particular, we do price off what we call the marginal cost. So the cost of producing that last unit of energy, we do use that as the price. And there are actually really good reasons for that. It helps with driving efficiencies and it helps with driving decarbonization. And um, the problem with that is there comes a point at which higher prices aren't actually communicating any useful economic signal anymore. And the only thing they're doing is pushing up costs for consumers. So a well-designed redistribution and windfall tax will find that point and cap prices at that point. So you go ahead and you let prices clear under that point, which continues to drive efficiency and continues to drive decarbonization. But by capping it at that point, you ensure that we make sure that once we're no longer reaping those benefits of decarbonization and efficiency, then we're not just pushing up costs for consumers. This is the approach the European Commission has taken in regards to windfall taxation, and I think it's a good one. There were other approaches proposed, which is where you cap each individual technology. That is not a good idea because it constrains our decarbonization um, efforts. So, for example, it means that you make just as much profit being a coal unit as a gas unit as a wind unit, even though we know that coal has the most emissions, gas has fewer, wind has fewer. That's not what we want. So the final thing I would say is that on the redistribution of, um, issue, it is absolutely true that we need to protect the most vulnerable households. And the way to do that, uh, well, the most effective way to do that is actually through using the taxation and social welfare redistribution mechanisms. We know from the research that things that put caps on energy or things that try to pull down prices and um, energy price in particular, so things like reducing carbon tax, reducing excise duty, reducing VAT, that actually accrues more to higher income households. And the reason for that is because higher income households spend more of their income or they consume higher amounts of energy to begin with. They're able to afford the second car. They have bigger households and they can afford to heat them. 
So if we go after policy responses that try to push down energy prices, we're channeling an awful lot of resources toward the richest households. However, if we go after policies that try to redistribute money toward lower income households through the tax and welfare system, then we're actually giving far more as a proportion of income to the lowest income households, and we're doing it through progressive taxation. And that is, uh, to date, the government has done some reduction in excise duties, um, but they've kind of moved away from that now toward the flat rate um, electricity credit, which is kind of in the middle, everybody gets the same in real terms, but as a proportion of their income, obviously, um, lower income households get a bit more. But they've also gone heavily after redistributing through the tax and welfare system, mostly through temporary measures. So on, for now, the response has been quite progressive. However, if those temporary measures are indeed temporary, rather than turn into something more long term, then we could see that change over the next few budgets. So I would encourage you in your discussions to try to think about how can we best harness our taxation and social welfare system, which is highly sophisticated and highly progressive, to continue and to improve on the, the concentration of resources toward the most vulnerable households. And um, because it has worked well to date, but there's no doubt that we can go further. So I'll stop there. I did go a bit over five minutes, but we also got Zoom bombed a bit. Thank you. Um, if people do have questions, you can put them in the uh, chat box and we can see whether we can get an answer there. Um, I do have a half a dozen questions here. Um, some of them have already been pointed on. Um, but do you both think that the energy companies have kept prices artificially high? I don't. Um, <laughs> I think this might be one of the points of disagreement between myself and John. So I'll go first on that. Um, I, looking at the data. OK, so first of all, um, fossil fuel extraction in Ireland is almost nil. There is carb. That's the only um, fossil fuel extraction in Ireland. There is no doubt that they are in, um, experiencing excess profits way beyond what they would have expected because they're taking the gas out of the ground at the same cost as they always did and selling it at way higher prices. Um, the government has announced a solidarity tax that in practice will only apply to CARB. Um, and I think there are really good reasons to do that, as I as I think there are really good reasons to tax fossil fuel companies across the world. I fully expect Carib to legally challenge that, and we'll see how they get on. You know, good luck to them. I, I don't know. I really could. I'm not a lawyer. I couldn't say how that one will go. On electricity, um, there is potential for um, excess profits from the electricity market, which is why the government has put in this windfall tax. So if you were a wind or a coal producer, um, you're still producing electricity at zero euro per megawatt hour if you're a wind producer, or you know, 40, 50 if you're coal, and you're selling it at 140, 150, 200. So there's a huge margin there. Um, the windfall tax should take care of that. Um, it remains to be seen whether the windfall tax will even bind because it may be that electricity prices are gonna come down. Um, and then finally, we've got the retail companies. Are the retail companies um, price gouging, essentially? Um, and I would say, first of all, if the retail companies are price gouging now, there is no reason to think they're only price gouging now and weren't price gouging up until now. Because if the market structure is such that you can get excess profits out of the electricity market, then we haven't changed our market structure at all. The only thing that has changed is the price of the of the raw material of the of the energy. So if we think that there might be excess profiteering going on in retail electricity companies, that's a long run problem that we need to address. However, I'm not convinced that it's happening right now, because if you look at where wholesale prices for electricity and gas have gone, they have gone as high as seven times their long run average, whereas retail prices haven't gone up by anything close to that. Uh, we are not seeing retail prices five, six, seven times what they were in 2020. Um, and then the second piece of evidence I would offer is the fact that several companies have left the market and all of the companies that left the market were retail only companies. So if we think that retail companies are overcharging households and thereby making a killing, we would not expect to see them leaving the market. If anything, we'd expect to see market entry. I think it is very, very interesting that we have several companies that have a retail and a generation arm. So there's Board Gosh, 
um, there's Energia, yeah, there's SSE, and then there's also ESB Electric Ireland. Now they're a separate case, we'll put them aside. But of the ones that have a retail and a generation arm, that none of them have left the market. It's only companies that had a retail arm only that have left. So that would suggest to me that these high prices on the wholesale that they have to buy at are unsustainable from a business point of view. And the reason the other companies that have a generation and a retail arm are sticking around is probably because they're cross subsidizing. So they're using their excess profits on the generation side to actually keep their retail prices down in order to enable them to compete. So that's why I think the policy response to date has been the right one. Go after the excess profits on the generation side via a windfall tax. But trying to go after retail companies, I think, is a bad move because it doesn't seem to me that they're making excess profits because they're actually leaving the market. However, John, I know you take a different view and I'd be, I'd be really interested to, to know what, what you think. No, thank you. I mean, I'm not saying that all the increase in the price of fossil fuels has to do with profiteering, but there is, in my view, um, certainly evidence that some of the increase has to do with, um, you know, opportunistic. And this is what happens always in a crisis. And it's not only in the energy sector, but, you know, can we say that the increase in the price of bread, for example, or basic food staples, are they down to the same proportionate increase in the price of energy inputs? I mean, I think there is evidence of profiteering, not just in the energy sector, but across um, the piece in terms of, you know, for profit, um, you know, capitalist companies seeing an opportunity here for, for making um, more, more money. But I think the more important issue is the one that Merlin mentioned in terms of this is a structural issue. Uh, in case you didn't know, you know, the World Bank, so it's not a, from a, a left wing or political perspective, it's from a very conservative, almost right wing view in the World Bank. I mean, they've estimated that the oil companies around the world have made three billion dollars a day for the past 50 years. So this is an extremely profitable sector. And this is the structural problem with that our dependence. I mean, essentially, to put it in a very um, compelling or maybe, you know, uh, overdramatic analogy, our society is like drug addicts. We are dependent upon the heroin of oil. Gas is like the methadone that we're going to use as a bridging fuel. This is the, the conventional narrative and so on. But it's also so complicated that I've been on strike, like a lot of my colleagues across the, um, the UK, in terms of you know protecting our pensions but sadly despite a campaign within my own union university colleges union to divest our pension schemes from fossil fuels many of our pension schemes are invested in this very profitable uh inelastic you know um in terms of the demand i mean if the price of of, of fuel goes up you have very little room often to you know move to a different source because you need to get that fuel, that's what it means. It means it's in, inelastic in, in demand is that you don't have the flexibility to move away. You absolutely need it in the same way that a drug addict needs their drug. In the same way, we need oil in particular to uh, fuel many parts of our, our lives. Coupled with that, and I suppose one of the differences between myself and Warren's uh, analysis, I'm talking on a more global macro level in terms of the structure of the economy and how it's connected to energy and the climate crisis, is that Again, not a particularly radical organization, but the International Monetary Fund, again, another uh, kind of right wing conservative um, global institution. I mean, uh, the report is a little bit old now. It goes back to 2017 or so, but I don't see how the analysis are any different now. And, and again, in case you didn't know, so these oil companies are making $3 billion a day for the past 50 years, but also about 7% of global GDP is in uh, hidden subsidies to fossil fuels around the world. In other words, we have a, a system whereby governments right across the world, so it's not just Saudi Arabia and Iran and oil producing companies, but our own societies are providing hidden subsidies that are locking us into this, um, you know, suboptimal and dangerous form of fuel because we know now is the major cause of the climate calamity. So for me, this really brings home this question of our, the need for massive structural changes. And while things like windfall taxes that myself and Merlin would probably support in terms of these excess profits are useful as intermediary measures, these, go, these do not go far enough in terms of the structural changes in our economy, particularly the one that I mentioned um, around economic growth. Is our, our, our dependence upon this as the major macro policy uh, you know, objective to solve the housing crisis, to solve poverty, and so on, is absolutely ecologically irrational. 
that there isn't enough earth to enable that type of growth that has been proposed, never mind globally, but even within our, within our own rich parts of the world. And there is no evidence, just to finish, um, there is no evidence that we can technologically decouple a growing economy from uh, energy uh, and climate impacts. We have to move to a non-growing or post-growth type of economy, and that a windfall fact, uh, tax will not do. So why we need to focus on, you know, how we can, you know, provide necessary funding for people struggling now, this is only a stopgap measure because it's not getting to the root of the problem. And as I say, the root of the problem is not just carbon, but it's a growth-based capitalist economy that has now become suboptimal. So in my view, while you can have ideological or, or you know, normative reasons for condemning capitalism, and I think they can be quite valid, I'm largely arguing from a purely scientific point of view that science is now telling us that we need to move beyond low carbon because we have the evidence has now become suboptimal and risky. It's now causing planetary breakdown. But at the same time, a capitalist growth-based economy itself is now functionally incoherent within the scientific parameters of what we've determined of our finite planet, particularly, just to finish, if we do have any concern for those in the global south who do need to be lifted out of poverty and so on, where growth is needed is in Asia, in China, in Africa, and so on. Our societies in the global north, and by, th by that I mean, you know, Europe, North America, Australasia, Japan, South Korea, perhaps, where maybe 15 to 20% of the world's population live, these societies are already massively wealthy. The problem is that it's badly distributed. So we need a redistributive policy. So a windfall tax on the rich, not just a windfall tax on fossil fuels, I think also has to be on the agenda in terms of dealing with the issues that we're now facing. As a continuation of that, do you feel that these windfall taxes ought to be a regular thing? Um, so the definition of a windfall is kind of an excess gain that was kind of unexpected and unanticipated. So I think purely by by definition, we would hope that they won't be a regular thing because we're hoping that we won't have wars and pandemics and things that create these windfalls. Um, if you're suggesting that, so uh, on the other hand, so there's two things we, we could take from this. One is, um, do we want to say that when any sector, not just uh, the energy sector experiences a windfall gain that a portion or the majority or all of that would be taxed. I think that would be a decent policy proposition. Um, and I think it would also be a pro-business proposition because it means that businesses have certainty. They know that when we have kind of the regular type of profits that we that we expect to make, that this portion of them will be taxed. And we know in advance that if we make giant windfalls, that a larger portion or all of them would be taxed. So I do think kind of having an ongoing commitment to windfall taxes in all sectors. So like one of the sectors that has the most experience in windfall taxation is the financial sector. So it is very much the case um, that when the financial sector makes windfall gains, they do tend to get taxed. Um, and there's a literature on that in various jurisdictions. I think there's certainly something to be said for shifting towards a kind of an ongoing policy of windfall gains will be taxed. And the way we have subsidized our renewable generation in particular to date um, kind of did the opposite of that. It was explicitly designed to kind of make them keep the windfall gains. In fairness, I think it was by accident. However, when it was pointed out that this could enable windfall gains, nothing was done about it until very recently. Um, and then on the other hand, um, the other way to kind of think about what you're asking is, should we just have like an ongoing, a higher level of taxation on profits in general? Um, and I would say that's certainly a discussion we could have. And it seems that some of the dire predictions about what would happen if you tax profits haven't really come to pass. Um, I think the there are kind of two questions that every single economy and society has to answer around taxation. So the first is how much do we want to take in taxation altogether as a proportion of, um, of GDP, if you like, or of economic activity? And then the second is how do we want to divvy that up 
between taxing income, taxing profits, taxing capital, taxing consumption, taxing property. Um, Ireland's uh, Ireland's kind of divvying up at the moment is kind of unusual in some respects in, um, in that we're kind of getting more and more and more and more from corporate profits and we don't really know why. Um, and uh, that's great as long as it lasts, but you know, may, it, maybe it'll all stop. Um, we take in a very small proportion of taxation on property compared to um, most OECD countries, for example. But these are kind of questions we should be asking on a kind of a, a long run basis, like how much do we think we should tax profits in general? Um, and I certainly agree that that's a question that we should be considering. Um, and again, I would make the point that this is a pro-business policy in that it provides certainty for businesses. So it's better for a business to know in advance that they're going to, to be taxed like X percent of their profits forever than for a business to know I'm I could be taxed anything from a tenth of X to a third of X and it's just going to bounce around year to year to year to year. Uncertainty is not what business is like, so I think um, it could be it could be posed in that aspect as well. I maybe I could just come in and well, I'm going to offer an explicitly pro people and pro planet position, which is essentially returning to debates we had in the 60s and 70s, where people may be surprised to know that we had quite a lot of nationalisation of the what was called the commanding heights of the economy, including in energy, transportation, housing, healthcare, and so on. And I'm absolutely convinced that, you know, windfall taxes and these reformist approaches, while welcome because they take the, the sharper edges off what we're now facing, particularly in terms of the millions uh, across the world who are suffering as a cost of the, as a result of the cost of profiteering crisis. Long term solutions really require major structural changes to the, of, to, to our economy. And that's why I go back to what I said in my opening remarks about a consideration of universal basic services that we need to seriously start considering decommodifying, i.e. taking out of the market and business purview, essential human needs like energy, like food, like transportation, like healthcare, and so on. And while to many of our ears, that sounds absolutely radical and completely outside the realm of the possible, we did have this 30, 40 years ago uh, in many countries. Ireland's rather unique in that we never really had a, a very well-developed welfare state. But certainly I'm convinced, again, yes, for normative and ideological reasons, I'm not a great fan of talking about poverty. Poverty is caused by inequality. Let's talk about getting rid of inequality. But purely for functional reasons, if we want to have a safe and just operating space for humanity, you may be familiar with the wonderful work and very visually attractive um, presentation of Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics. In other words, we have to stay below the safe planetary boundaries that have been identified in terms of biodiversity and climate change and so on. But also there's a social floor below which nobody should fall. And the sweet spot is in the donut, this kind of ring donut idea. So below the ceiling of the planetary boundaries and above the floor are basic social needs. And I cannot see how any uh, neoliberal, purely free market approach is going to get this. I, and again, I'm not against in certain sectors that we can have a free market. I think in computer goods, in suites, in toys, in certain types of entertainment, yeah, fill your boots with a pro-free market perspective. But when it comes to essential human needs, like electricity, and of course, that's, I, I think, partly behind Warren's very good point that if we're looking at a renewable energy future, we are looking at the almost complete electrification of every part of our lives. So that's something we need to prepare ourselves for about who and how and under what conditions is electricity going to be produced. And I'm certainly uh, of the view that we are going to have to start talking about democratically owning and controlling the energy means of production. Why is it that the, 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 the limit of our transition vision and certainly this is uh, part of what's going on down south, but it's no different than what's going on in other parts of the world, is that we're shaping our uh, energy transition to move away from a private-owned fossil fuel-based energy system to a private-owned renewable energy system. And I don't think that is sufficient for what we're going to need. I think, actually, if you want to get increased democratic legitimacy behind the energy transition and to avoid what we've seen in places like France with the Gilets Jaunes movement and an unjust transition of a diesel tax being put on with no compensating mitigating measures for working class people, or the unjust transition that we've seen in the Irish Midlands with the closure of Ordnamona, 
I think we have to find ways of the state or municipal bodies, local government, a mixed economy of the energy means of production that isn't just about private corporations moving from being fossil fuel providers to now being renewable energy providers. And again, as I, I say that for scientific and functional reasons, as well as democratic and political reasons, but I do think we have to return to those debates that we, we had and we're lost in the in the 30 years of the wilderness we've been in under neoliberalism, where everything's been privatized, commoditized, and so on. And we've come to the end of that particular story. And if anything, we need to now revisit debates around welfare and the welfare state. And as I say, the decommodification through universal basic services of the basic human needs that people need of energy, of health, of transportation, and particularly of, of energy. And we do have examples of that across Europe where nationalized energy systems and even the municipal ownership of renewable energy facilities are actually already there. But I think Ireland is an outlier in many ways in being so thoroughly neoliberal that even everything I've said there would strike most people as batshit crazy. And that must give us pause for thought. Why is it a fairly well-reasoned and evidence-based proposal for the nationalization or municipalization of particularly our energy facilities is so far outside what's called the Overton window of policy development. Uh, to me, it's an indication of how far to the right our policy discourse has become. And of course, that's something we should recognize. This means we have a work cut out for us. But I'm certainly convinced we have the evidence that this is a functional and equitable way in which we can manage this energy transition and generate benefits for people. But just to finish, nobody ever rioted for austerity in history. The energy transition in particular has to be demonstrated to be in the interest and benefits of ordinary citizens. And what better way is if that they can own and control and benefit directly to dividends or part ownership of the energy facility. I think we would then get much more democratic buy-in for the energy uh, transition. Because at the moment, that we have a, lo a lot of local opposition to renewable energy uh, you know, um, citing because people are saying, why is our areas going to be, you know, exploited for the private gain? And I think we could get over that if ordinary people could benefit from this energy transition. There's a comment here on the uh, chat. Um, I think it's from Oliver. Do you want to make that for the recording? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ben. I, 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 I think in some ways John might have covered it there. It, it led naturally from from um, from what Mern was was discussing. So, so my question is: So Mern, you were discussing about windfall taxes, and it, it caused me to think uh, about uh, the purpose of corporation tax, to or at least an initial purpose of it, which was to tax unproductive profits. Um, and then John's comments are obviously very crouched in, you know, uh, a return to basics. Um, in some ways, in return to a, a, an economy from from the mid twentieth century, um, so, and so my question is: is is this a, a return to radicalism? Is it actually a return to basics? Um, and have we been swallowed up in a narrative of a certain form of economy since then, since the mid nineteenth, or since since the mid twentieth century, that's become self serving rather than serving of of society? Yeah. So. Um political economy is not my area at all so I won't go too much into kind of commenting on the detail of that like it, it sounds like that's much more John's area but I do think the idea of a return to the radical actually being a return to the basics yeah that 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 uh, that shows up again and again and again um throughout history and I think it is happening here to some degree so if you think about it from in terms of electricity markets um liberalization and that kind of thing um, there were reasons for moving away from publicly state-owned utilities. I'm not saying whether those reasons are good or bad, um, but it, it was particularly kind of following the Nordic model that seemed to have worked very well from uh, in terms of um, liberalizing electricity markets and um, introducing private sector competition and participation uh, while having very strong regulation in order to ensure um, Initially, the focus really was making sure we had secure energy because before decarbonization was so firmly on the agenda, the main thing was we just we don't want we don't want the lights to go out, basically. Um, but then the regulations moved on to to realize we not only need to ensure security, but also sustainability. 
um, and it was following kind of Nordpool was the original market, um, which uh, so kind of the idea is like it was a pool of a market and um, in, in, in the Nordics and now more and more countries have joined and then that, that model was essentially transplanted to the rest of Europe and Ireland um, implemented it and updated our own electricity market in order to comply with those regulations. Um, but now, as we get more and more renewables on the system, there's a kind of a question of, well, do we actually need more control? Because as you need more renewables, then the idea of the, the systems that were set up were really, really good at driving investment toward the least cost technologies. But as the system becomes more integrated and more complex, we have to ask the question as to whether or not this electricity market design is actually driving us toward the least cost system rather than the least cost technologies. Um, and that is a challenge that has not been um, solved. However, I think Ireland is seeing these issues first for two reasons. Number one, we're a small, synchronous, isolated power system. Um, and secondly, we have very high renewable targets and we're meeting them. So we are seeing levels of renewable integration that no other system is seeing and other systems that are seeing them, they're part of an AC connected grid, whereas we're an isolated system with only DC connect connections to Great Britain so far and some coming to France. So I suppose this is a very long winded way of saying that's one particular example of returning to the radical actually being a return to basics. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to keep sight of the European realities and structures in which in which we operate. Um, and but while remaining cognizant of what makes Ireland unique and different. Um, so I would actually disagree with um, your comments at the end, John, about how public ownership would spur um, kind of public acceptance of renewable energy infrastructure and energy infrastructure that's required, because that's not actually what the evidence suggests. Um, there is multiple studies done, some by us in ESRI, others by researchers in um, University of Galway, um, Noreen Brennan in particular, and I'd be happy to send those papers on to anyone who's interested, um, that looks at what does drive acceptance of renewable energy infrastructure in Ireland. And actually ownership, um, whether it's by means of a kind of a share or that yields a financial dividend, is not um, associated with increased acceptance of renewable energy. What people do want is they do want a financial um, gain, but they don't want ownership of the project. They would rather some kind of a payment be made that's not linked to an equity stake in the project. But the main thing that drives acceptance is people want jobs um, and investment and growth in their communities. Now, Ireland is an outlier here. If you look again at the Nordic model and um, that mandated ownership in local energy projects for local communities, and that did seem to be associated with increased acceptance. We just not, we're not seeing that in the data here in Ireland. So I think if we went after more of a kind of a community schemes approach that includes investment and employment in the area, um, I mean, I know plenty of people who've moved to Dublin whose parents, what they want for them was for them to be able to get a job in their local community and they simply couldn't. So if, if you gave most kind of people from a rural background a choice between you can have a financial stake in the wind farm up the road or you can have a job for your son or your daughter in the area where they grew up, most people would choose the latter. It makes sense intuitively and it's what we see in the data as well. This is a really, really good, good discussion in terms of, well, certainly evidence that I've done in Northern Ireland is counter to not completely what Mirren is saying is that I think the jobs issue is really important for people. If, if jobs can be seen as part of a new energy transition, people are more likely to get behind it. But there certainly is evidence that we're more likely to get a, a job rich renewable energy transition the more that these actually are either highly regulated and coordinated by the state, if not outrightly owned, controlled and managed in some way in a democratic um, forum outside the purely private market system. So we're not talking here about a pure state owned Soviet style ownership or, you know, a neoliberal free market. And I think that the mix of ownership and control and the governance of, of this will, will differ. But certainly I think, you know, one advantage that we have in terms of a more state led managed process of coordination is the regional um, imbalance we have across the island in terms of economic development. I mean, most of the, the jobs, infrastructure, you know, critical uh, government services, 
you know, high wealth creating businesses are all on the East Coast, not all, but, you know, there was a, an imbalance on the East Coast of the island, you know, between Belfast and, and Dublin. And then we have a lot of the renewable energy is actually being produced on, on the West Coast. So I think there is a way of integrating renewable energy development with economic uh, development as well to um, address that reason and balance. But that has to be coordinated by the state. There has to be an integration of industrial strategy, re renewable energy um, strategy. And I also think that there are natural monopolies. And to me, it doesn't make sense in terms of electricity or indeed transportation or certainly in healthcare and education to have a private or a purely private, private pre, uh, pre market or pro market approach is that these are natural monopolies which are you know more efficiently um you know developed by the state or indeed a much more mixed economy uh, in terms of the transition and we have to remember um folks history is also a good lesson here is that ireland has done this before i mean ardena crusher you know the huge shannon hydroelectric plant developed in the early part of the foundation of the state in the late 1920s it was a state project and at one point, I think, you know, it was supplying something like 25 or 30 percent of, you know, again, the very early stage development of our economy. So there we have an example where the state can actually create these energy transitions. I'm not saying we have to, you know, deliberately do carbon copy of that. But I think we do have examples of state led energy transitions, which can be quite effective. And also that many of us, or at least our grandparents, perhaps, or some of us, depending on our age, our parents remember, is the electrification of rural Ireland uh, from the 40s to the 60s as another example of, of a state-led transition. So I think we do need to start putting back on the table what is the most effective, the most the democratic, legitimate, and indeed the speed at which we need to make this transition. And we are lucky, as Wirren points out, both north and south, we've achieved very high levels of penetration of particularly onshore renewable energy. You know, the big challenge technologically is getting offshore wind, which would get over some of the local objections of people in terms of onshore and so on. So we're in a, we're in a good position in terms of what's the best way to manage, um, you know, this transition. So I'm certainly uh, not persuaded that a purely pre free market private ownership and control of our energy system is the way to go. I'm happy to be persuaded that we don't we don't want to go completely to a state owned energy system. And it is about what is the mix of public and private ownership and control and the governance of this energy system that we, we need. But I do think the state has to coordinate this energy transition. Otherwise, we will, I, I think, get suboptimal transition pathways as a result of failed or um, you know technologies that can result in I think a lot of problems down the line, but we are learning as as we go. And you know I think Merlin is quite correct that the island of Ireland in particular, because again, despite what the DUP and unionists may not like, the fact is we have a an all island electricity uh, market, and we are a kind of a, a test case for what is the most effective governance um, system? Is there a point beyond which perhaps that a purely private led renewable energy transition reaches a threshold and then the state has to come in, you know, it, like the person I'm thinking of here is, is Mariana Mazzacuto, who talks about the entrepreneurial state, that we need to swing the pendulum back from that neoliberal pr purely free market approach back towards the state actually taking a, a leading coordinating role in managing and regulating this transition. Yeah, I think I've got time for one more question. Um, what could we learn from other countries who have experienced in ongoing crises like this before? There was an article earlier this week in The Guardian about Greece striking a deal with its supermarkets to sell staple items at fixed prices. Could something like that be worthwhile here? And then if there was one thing you could implement to ease the current situation, what would that be? Yeah, I. one of the remarks John made that in his opening statement that I 100% uh, agreed with is it, it is complete rubbish to say that um, 
demands for increased wages is driving inflation and anyone who anyone who says that is just not acquainted with the facts i mean it, it is a statement of fact that energy prices rose long before wage increase demands came um, and it's also the case that um increased wages are required um, in order to protect um, particularly vulnerable low-paid workers um, what i would say though is going back to the lessons from the past and, and from other countries that you asked about is that a wage price spiral is something that can take hold and we do need to guard against it and for that reason and um, the it is it is counterproductive to let wages do what energy prices are doing up until now, which is to push prices up even further. And um, I'm not a macroeconomist. I couldn't say whether we're at that point, but I do know that that lesson has been learned. And, and I, I doubt that we're in danger of that happening yet. But what we do need to learn is that using the taxation and social welfare system is also a very progressive and effective way of protecting people, particularly unwaged people from the impacts here. So I'm not for a minute saying that wage increases should be off the table. I And I agree with John that saying that they're driving this issue, it's just not true. But it is the case that utilizing the taxation and welfare system is a way of, progress, of protecting vulnerable people um, while not potentially contributing toward the wage price spiral, which we don't want to see. So I suppose that would be my take home message in terms of lessons we can learn from elsewhere and from the past, and also a lesson that other countries can learn from Ireland, because there are aspects of our taxation welfare system that are progressive that other countries do not have. And we can actually show leadership in this area. Yeah, I, I would agree what we're in the saying. I think we're not at that stage yet that workers uh, should be given legitimate, um, at least at, if not slightly above inflation pay increases, because it's, you know, the simple maths is that if you're offered a below inflation wage increase, that's a wage cut. So we can't, in, in many respects, condone that. I don't think we're at that stage where wages are, will start pushing up in inflation. I would offer two views in terms of policy proposals, one that's actually already been implemented and one that I think sadly will not be. The one that we already see, and it has, has some modest impact in Germany, is where for three months they radically reduced the cost of public transportation for, for, for people. I don't know what, what exactly the details of 10 euros you could get you anywhere for, a, for a, um, a month or something. It won't help everybody, particularly those who are badly served by public transportation in rural parts of Ireland. But something like that certainly would, I think, help uh, some people in terms of dealing with transportation costs, particularly if they're dependent on, on their cars, for example. The policy that I would propose, but sadly would not be taken up by any government, um, is a job guarantee by the state. So I think we, people need jobs and they need job security as well. You know, the, whole, the issue is not just jobs, it's the quality of those jobs and the, the wages and conditions and so on. I sadly think what we're going to see, certainly in the UK, and we've seen this in the past, whereby joblessness and unemployment is the price we pay for keeping inflation down. We have to remember, and again, this is where I do offer my own macro political economy perspective, is that inflation is class war. Inflation is often fought uh, on, on the terrain of making people unemployed. We've seen this in the past in terms of, you be, you know, you're made unemployed in order to keep prices down. Um, and I think that's sadly what's going to happen, certainly in the UK. Unemployment will be the price that ordinary people pay to keep inflation down. Whereas a better proposal and one to go back to what Miriam was saying in our opening remarks of where we can learn lessons from the, uh, the, the New Deal in America in the 1930s, but I'm here updating it with um, a new body of work that I think we should all try and understand because I think it, it, it's quite revealing about our current state of the economy and actually provides a lot of positive proposals for how we can fund um, a lot of the transitions that we need is modern monetary theory. And, you know, that the, the modern monetary theory, I'll just briefly outline, is basically that we have most of us a wrong view of how state finances work. Most of us have a view and it's propagated in the academy, in our media, and in our policy circles, that the house household analogy is what the state is. You know, if you're a household or an individual, you have to earn money in order to, to then spend it, or you have to make uh, cuts in your budget to free up, you know, um, resources elsewhere. 
And therefore, we get this analogy that state has the tax and then it spends. Actually, modern monetary theory in, in, in analyzing countries like the UK, the US, it is different for the Republic of Ireland because it's part of the Eurozone. But the idea that um, you have to tax before you spend gets the logic wrong. States create money by spending it into existence. They then destroy it through taxation effectively. So we've got the story wrong. States are not like households. And it partly explains the issue that Murren was talking about in terms of the 30 year uh, extraordinary example of Japan, who had, you know, high rates of, um, you know, public debt, but the economy hasn't uh, collapsed. And that's the other issue of this modern monetary theory perspective. There's this kind of almost moral panic about public debt. And there is a point at which, you know, an unsustainable public debt becomes a problem. But if you think about it, if, if the public sector is in debt, who's benefiting? Logically, where's the credit on the other side? And that's us in the non-state sector. So I think we need to start getting our heads around how public finances work. And in particular, as I say, this modern monetary theory, which I've become much more convinced as a more accurate functional description of how state finances work. Its argument is that to fight inflation, we need public debt funded job creation to create more wealth and assets and so on within society, rather than what we've seen from 2008 on, which certainly in Britain was a decade of austerity, which killed people. We have the evidence. And I think sadly, that's how a lot of governments are gonna actually approach this current crisis, is that they'll engage in deficit reduction, reduction in public uh, sector, you know, spending and so on, which is going to cause immeasurable harm to our societies uh, and so on. So what I, I, I would suggest is a job guarantee and maybe more modestly something like what Germany done in terms of reducing public transportation. My own view in cities like Belfast, Cork and Dublin, in, on certain routes, we should have free public transportation, which we already have in, in, in many other cities around the world. It pays for itself in terms of connectivity, air quality, pollution, less of a burden on the healthcare system and so on. So free public transportation and a job guarantee. Great, thank you. Um, I think the time has come that we need to close this. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Lynch and Professor Barry for joining us. And I think I'm heading back to Oliver for the rest of the meeting so thank you guys thanks so much um and if, if there's any if there's any follow-up just email me i'd be happy to send on any of those papers or anything really great to chat to you guys will do thank you bye